Greetings. My name is Karen Bandine Roach. I'm the Frank Hurley and Catherine Dorier Professor and Chair of Biostatistics at Johns Hopkins. And it's my pleasure to be with you today to go over a very brief module to introduce competing risks analysis. Let's go ahead and begin with some motivation for the underpinnings of this topic and why we would wish to study it. The underpinnings, of course, are survival analysis. And so this is a technique to which I believe you have been introduced through this series. Survival analysis has the purpose of characterizing distributions of times to events. And so we'll carry the example that you see through this entire module. The time from COVID -relate related hospitalization admission to a subsequent clinical event that could be death, it could be progression to severe disease or discharge. If we take it for now as death, let's signify that time from hospital admission to death by a capital T. Then hopefully you'll recall some frequently used measures and statistics having to do with survival analysis listed on the second part of this slide. First of all, it's the survival function, which we label as S of T, defined as the probability that my event time of interest here, death, is longer than some time little t. And we characterize this as an entire curve where at each little t time on the x-axis, we have the proportion of individuals who have not yet experienced the event. So you'll remember that this is a monotone decreasing curve as more and more people fail over time. And hopefully you'll remember as well that the Kaplan-Meier curve is a technique by which we can estimate the survival function. Further, continuing through the bullets, the log rank test is a technique by which we can conduct inference to compare survival functions between groups, men and women, different race ethnicity groups, people of different ages, et cetera. What is commonly called the cumulative incidence function is then just defined as one minus S of T. In that case, it would just be the cumulative proportion who fail, who die, for example, by any given time. And then finally, if we wish to perform regression analyses to study times to events in terms of covariates, then by far the most common approach is the Cox proportional hazards model, which hopefully you already have been ex uh, exposed to. Continuing on, reminder survival analysis, the special feature which necessitates a special class of analyses at all is censoring. So by way of example, censoring has to do with the fact that not all people hospitalized for COVID-19 have an untimely death. Rather, some individuals are discharged before they ever die. They're frequently still alive when the study ends. And so in that case, all we know is that the death time is later than whatever is the time that the study ends. That illustrates what censoring is. Then, in order for a standard survival analysis of the type you've already been exposed to, to be valid, we have a couple of key assumptions needed. The first is that the event of interest may occur following the censoring event. So here, for sure, if the study ends, people can die later than that. There's, there's no problem with this particular example. And then the second assumption is that of independent censoring which says that for each time, the instant instantaneous probability of a failure later than that time is independent of people, is sorry, independent of whether a person was censored or not among individuals surviving up to that time. And so in our example, if somehow we just have a study that lasts to a given time and the study happens to end at that time randomly, then perhaps it's reasonable to think that the individuals still at risk may have the same instantaneous probability of death at each given time as 
individuals who merely survived to that time, uh, but could still potentially be studied. Consider in contrast, the potentially censoring event of discharge. Well, that's, that's totally different. If I have two individuals in the hospital, they've been in the hospital a given amount of time, and then on that day, one of them is discharged, the other is still in the hospital, well, that's not independent. It's very likely that that person who was discharged has gotten better and probably has a lower probability of dying than the individual still in the hospital. And so that assumption of independent censoring would be violated in that case. This begins to get at why a competing risks special methodology would be needed. And so let's focus on a different COVID-19 outcome, which is progression to being intubated, otherwise called a progression to a severe COVID-19 case of disease. Well, so we know that not all people hospitalized for COVID-19 ever are intubated, so they, they could be censored. But on the other hand, some COVID-19 patients die before they ever progress to severe disease. This may sound counterintuitive, but it actually happens quite frequently for older adults because very old individuals may have a do not intubate order. And so that means they can't ever be intubated and, and potentially die before that happens. Once a person dies, whether or not it's due to an order, they can't possibly ever again be intubated in the future. And so in this sense, death doesn't really censor the occurrence of dis severe disease. It competes with it. It precludes the possibility of that other event ever happening again. And so notice that the key assumptions of standard survival analysis are violated in that sense. Remember the first assumption was that the event of interest can occur following the censoring event. Well, if we're interested in severe disease, but death happens first, well then no, severe disease can't then ever follow that event of death. That assumption's violated. So also is the possibility of independent censoring. And so let's switch to an event instead of death of discharge. So once again, um, the assumption was that for every time the instantaneous probability of subsequent failure is independent of being censored among individuals surviving to that time. Well, again, no. If I have two individuals who both have made it up to a certain point without experiencing severe disease, one of them remains in the hospital, the other is discharged, for sure, the probability of severe disease almost certain to be lower for the person who was discharged than the person who's still in the hospital. And so that assumption of independent censoring also is typically violated in the competing context. So finally, getting to the bottom bullet in a competing risks setting, that means that only one of the possible events as defined in a competing setting can occur. One and only one of them. Once the first event happens, none of the others can, at least as defined within a competing risk setting. And so we've already gone over something like the subtler example there, death while in the hospital. So even for death, I would claim that discharge competes with this outcome rather than censors it. Because two people, one in the hospital, one discharged, the risk for death is almost certainly lower for the one who was discharged. And so typically we end up needing to study death before discharge as being our defined event. So with that introduction, here's our lecture objectives for the rest of this brief module. I want you to be able to recognize an analog to Kaplan-Meier analysis, which is appropriate in the competing risk setting, 
That is to estimate the cumulative incidence function, but to find a different way than we did it in the survival setting a few slides ago. Second, to be able to interpret an analog to the Cox proportional hazards model, which is a cause specific hazard regression. And then finally, just to at a very high level, be able to identify a few other competing risk regression approaches than cause specific hazard modeling.